Welcome to the lesson 4 of industrial instrumentation. Uh, in this lesson, I will cover strain gauge, one of the very I mean important sensor in instrumentation. However, before, uh, before I start the, this lesson, I must uh, solve because as I promised that uh, at the end of the lesson 3 that uh, I have given the lesson 3 I mean problem 3.4 to 3.6 which I will solve uh, in this class. Now, problem number 3.4 as you know is the magnitude of the dynamic, dynamic error dynamic error is or I should write d e mod of d e should be less than equal to uh, 0 0.01, because you know that uh, it is a first order instrument even though I told that the uh, error can be plus minus 1 percent, but in the case of first order instruments we have seen that there is no overshoot. So, error should be always less than uh, can only have uh, it should be less than that means it should be always 0 0.99 instead of 1.01. .01. So, if it is there, so the magnitude ratio we know equal to y by k by x. So, it should be 0 0.99 because 0 0.01 person uh, 1 person. So, it is uh, 0 0.01 should be less than equal to y by k by x right and as you know this is equal to 1 upon under uh, square root 1 plus omega tau square. Now, omega is given let us uh, calculate for omega equal to uh, 4. So, if I calculate for omega I mean uh, frequency of 4 hertz. So, it will be 2 pi into 4 because f equal to 4 hertz as it is given. So, it will be omega square will be equal to 631. So, it will be 0 0.981 uh, into 1 plus omega square tau square equal to 1. So, it will give you omega square tau square equal to 0 0.01936. So, tau will be equal to uh, another square root 0 0.01936 divided by omega square is 631. So, it will give you uh, tau equal to 5.6 millisecond. Similarly, uh, if we uh, take f equal to 1 hertz, because we say that the frequency will lie between 1 hertz and 4 hertz. So, we will get tau equal to 0 0.0226 second. So, I should say that the tau should lie between 5.6 milliseconds and 0 0.0226 second. That means, 5.6 millisecond tau 0 0.0226 seconds. If the tau lies between uh, this the time constant lies between this uh, value, so I can handle the signal for a first order instrument of 4 hertz to uh, 1 hertz to 4 hertz. Now, let us solve the problem number 3.5. 3.5 you see we have to find the the highest frequency right that was the um, problem it is also a first order instrument. So, um, problem number 5 solution to problem 3.5 
so it will look like d equal to y by k by x minus 1 it is here the error is plus minus 5 percent so obviously so it will be 0 0.95 less than equal to 1 upon root over 1 omega tau square sorry that was a given so i can write that from this omega tau square will be less than equal to 0 0.108 so i can write omega will be less than equal to 0 0.01095 radian per second so i have not solved the intermediate step that you can do but this is our principle how we can find the value and uh, this is our answer so if omega is less than that i mean that means it can handle the frequency which has a uh, circular frequency value of 0 0.01 um, 0 0.01095 radians per second now problem number 6 3.6 rather so the solution to problem 3.6 it looks uh, we have a dynamic error of plus minus 6 percent right we have given error constant xi you have given 0 0.6 and since it is a uh, first order instrument so it will lie between uh, sorry it is a second order instrument so it will lie between 0 0.94 it can overshoot so plus minus both plus minus 6 percent will be valid here so y by k by x equal to 1.06 right so we have two uh, equation for this and uh, that means uh, 1.06 we know in this case 1.06 greater than equal to 1 upon if I take 1 minus omega by omega n whole square square plus 2 xi omega by omega n whole square square half oh, I am sorry I think there will be no square here. So, this will be so it will get uh, this is one and another one will be 0.94 it is 0.94 get uh, less than equal to 1 minus omega by omega n whole square square plus 2 zeta 2 xi omega by omega n whole square to the power half. So, if we solve these two, so I will get omega n greater than or equal to 730 radians per second. This is our answer, right. Now, uh, let me go back to the uh, our today's lecture it is strain gauge now contents as i told solution to the problems of 3.4 to 3.6 of lesson 3 application of strain gauge derivations of gauge factor composition of the strain gauge material bonded metal foil gauge gauge length backing material adhesives semiconductor strain gauge strain gauge in a Wheatstone bridge and temperature compensation scheme and problem on strain gauge. We will solve some problem later on also. Now, you see that uh, strain gauge is basically a device is a when it is subjected to some um, subjected to some force that means, if there is a stress there will be a change of strain that means, what will happen that is there is a change of resistance. So, that change of resistance uh, can be calibrated and that or measured and can be future in future can be calibrated uh, in terms of um, 
in terms of either load or displacement. Now, directly this strain gauge is used for the measurement of load, indirectly it is used for measurement of displacement, small displacement as well as for measurement of pressure. We will see later on that it is used for the measurement of the pressure when it is used in conjunction with the diaphragm gauge. Right? Now, let us look at uh, the, so that is the basic application of strain gauge. Now, let us look at the derivations of the gauge factor of the strain gauge. Now, uh, I mean it is is a con at the end of the lesson the viewer will know the derivation of the gauge factor of a strain gauge, strain gauge composition and temperature compensation. Let us take a wear of length L and cross sectional area A and if this wear is stretched or compressed its resistance will change due to dimensional change and because of the property of the materials called piezo resistance which indicates the dependence of resistivity on the strain. Now, resistance R is given by as you know this is very uh, common equations rho L by R equal to rho L by A where rho is the resistivity of the material of the wire, L is the length of the wire and A is the area of cross section of the wire. right? And if I take differentiation of this, so it would dr equal to a rho dl plus l d rho minus rho l d a upon a square, if all are variable. So, in this case we will get equation like this. Now, see the axial strain we defined as this one that means axial strain we have defined epsilon a equal to epsilon equal to dl by l. The transverse strain we have defined as epsilon t equal to d d d by d, which if you take derivative it will become one, um, 1 by 2 or half equal to d a by a, where a is the area of the area of the cross section of the strain gauge. Now, Poisson's ratio is defined by you see nu equal to minus epsilon t by epsilon a or epsilon t by epsilon simple epsilon. <coughs> Again the volume of the wire V equal to L is you know, V is the volume. So, it is A multiplied by the length of the wire. If we differentiate we will get d V A d L plus L d A. Moreover, we can uh, prove that del V equal to almost equal to A L epsilon 1 minus 2 nu. Now, I will combine these two. I mean, so, I will get after combining L and epsilon, after combining L and epsilon, we got d L. So, 1 minus 2 nu. So, this can be further simplified. Again, we know that del V equal to A d L plus L d A. So, A d L 1 minus 2 nu equal to A d L plus L d A. So, minus 2 nu A d L equal to L d A. Now, d r equal to A rho d L plus L d rho minus rho L into d A upon A square. So, it will further simplify it like this, right, because we are using the Poisson's ratio. So, we make a positive. So, I will get the equation the change of resistance equal to d r rho d L rho is the resistivity of the material of the strain gauge multiplied by d L 1 plus 2 nu where nu is the Poisson's ratio divided by A L d rho by A. It can be further simplified uh, if I write like this d L equal to because as you know that R equal to because you know that we know that R equal to rho L by A. So, we have applied this here. So, it will be d r into r uh, sorry rho d l equal to then uh, r. Uh, if you replace rho then it will be r into a, a will cancel out. So, we take the l in the denominator and r on the left hand side. So, change of resistance per unit value of the resistance that we have actually done. So, the gauge factor is given by it is usually defined as lambda is very standard notation for the gauge factor equal to dr by r upon dl by l equal to 1 plus 2 nu plus d rho by rho 
upon d l by l. Now, see this uh, this one is actually resistance change due to change of length, this is the resistance change due to change of area. Typically, its value lies between 0 to 0.5 for all materials, and finally, the that is the resistance change due to f due to the effect which is called piezo resistance effect, right. Now, in the case of semiconductor, this will be very high, whereas in the case of uh, metal, I mean this is predominant in the case of metal, you will find 1, whereas in the case of semiconductor gauge, this is predominant. You can almost neglect these two part because it is so high, right. Now, further we simplified, we have introduced d rho by rho upon d l by l equal to pi 1 into E, where pi 1 where E is the modulus of elasticity and pi 1 is the capital pi 1 is the longitudinal piezo resistance coefficients which can be positive or negative. right? So, with this that uh, gauge factor expression of gauge factors we have seen. Now, we always want for in the instrumentation systems or for the strain gauge that the gauge factor should be as high as possible because if the gauge factor of high then for unit strain I will get more change of resistance my signal conditioning circuit will be simplified that is requirement for all sensors. right? Now, let us go to the instrumentation lab and see one practical uh, strain gauge uh, how it looks like and which is used as a displacement sensor uh, to make a small uh, I mean displacement sensor that means for the small measurement of small displacement we will come back after some time. It is a displacement sensor based on strain gauges. We have already seen that in all strain gauge measurements we usually we use a bridge which strong bridge with four arms and for temperature compensation as well as for the larger output, we usually use at least two strain gauges and sometimes you will find the four strain gauges. In this displacement sensor, we have two strain gauges and one will be on axial elongation, other will be on axial uh, compression. And if we put these two strain gauges on the opposite arm of the bridge, I will get larger output. You see here that uh, there is a strain gauge on this side, you can see here. So, uh, and there is another strain gauge on the back side of this brass plate. And how it works, you see, when I give the uh, displacement like this, you see here, the displacements I am giving here. So, this strain gauge will be under axial elongation and the strain gauge on the back side that means on this side will be under compression. So, if I put on the opposite arm of the Wiston bridge obviously I will get double the output as well as you will find that I will receive the I will get the temperature compensation in this particular circuit. And this particular displacement sensor is used for the displacement of uh, small displacement like less than 1 centimeter and that type. Welcome back to the classroom. You know the strain gauge uh, is implemented in several different ways. Number 1 is unbonded metal wire gauge, number 2 is a bonded metal wire gauge and number 3 is a bonded metal foil gauge and bonded number 4 is bonded semiconductor gauge and 5 is diffuse semiconductor gauge. Now, in the case of uh, bonded metal wire gauge where I can have any uh, unbonded metal wire gauge. Suppose, I have a two pillars. Sorry. Suppose, I have a two pillar that means, uh, two pillars here. So, I have put a wire. So, if there is if this if this pillar is tilted like this one Okay, so, so, some stress will be developed because this wire will be under tension in that case. So, the some stress will be developed. So, it is unbonded strain gauge because any wire a simple wire if it is under if you pull on both side. Okay. So, it will have certain amount of stress and strain. Right? 
So, this type of Wolf's measurement was um, I mean people used some time back. So, we can call I mean it is some sort of academic interest because unwanted wear strain gauge is very uncommon nowadays. Now, next we will find most widely used uh, gauges bonded metal wire gauge right and here in this case that the, the strain gauge will be bonded on a uh, backing material. It looks like that means it looks like I have a backing material. So, over which this strain gauge is put like this one. Right. So, I have a backing material there. So, we have electrical connections we have taken out. So, this is a backing materials are various types which will be discussed after some time. So, this is a strain gauge which is called bonded strain gauge. So, it is actually with the adhesives it is to be this is our backing material and it is to be placed on a body on which we are interested to measure the stress of strain. Right. Third comes the bonded metal wire gauge which is most widely used uh, metal wire gauge nowadays because we will concentrate on this uh, a lot because it has some advantage we will see that the transfer strain will be very less in this case because the same technology whatever they are using for making the PCB it is also used for making the bonded metal wire, metal foil gauge. And interestingly you will find uh, you will find the shape is something like that, that uh, this end resistance effect will very much less in the case of bonded metal wire gauge. Now, bonded semiconductor gauge is also there, you will find the semiconductor itself is used to bond on a material. So, it is a instead of uh, I mean simple um, wire type of gauge, I am using the semiconductor string. Whereas, the diffuse semiconductor is something different, you will find that uh, in the one of the example of the diffuse semiconductor gauge is the is a pressure gauge, a diaphragm pressure gauge, uh, where the diaphragm material is made of semiconductor. It looks like this. Suppose I have a diaphragm, circular diaphragm we can see here. So, I have four strain gauges here, suppose two on the. So, this material is semiconductor. And where I want to make the strain gauges, that portions will be topped. So, if I do I mean dope like this that two portions, so I will get uh, some gauge there and this type of strain gauges is called is called the diffuse semiconductor gauge. It is used uh, for uh, it is a very because of the, the advantage of semiconductor strain gauge as I told you earlier is a high gauge factor whereas, in this almost you can say 60 to 70 times the gauge factor is more than that of the uh, wire type of gauge or uh, gauge made of metal. Right. So, composition of strain gauge material that is very important. We will find that there are many strain gauge available in the markets, and we will find here the different um, gauge factors we are given. Lambda equal to 2 is a very common type of very cheap low cost strain gauge, it is called constant and or advanced. Here, the composition is 55 percent copper and 45 percent nickel. Then you have isoelastic which is 36 percent nickel, 8 percent chromium, 4 percent manganese, silicon and 52 percent iron. Then you have isoelastic 2, these are all trade name because you see the strain gauge was first developed, I mean commercial strain gauges which are developed mostly in the industry. So, they have given some trade names, uh, later on they gave, gave the composition, but that is the, the funny name they have given, constant isoelastic uh, like that. Then we have molybdenum. Uh, isoelastic 2 which is 36 percent nickel, 8 percent chromium, 0 0.5 percent molybdenum and 55.5 percent uh, I mean iron or steel. So, lambda is 3.6 not very high. Karma which is lambda equal to 2 because you see what is the use of these two you will find the applications will be different if you have that 74 percent nickel at 20 percent because strain gauges are used for various uh, environments somewhere you will find the reduce at reducing atmosphere somewhere it is oxidizing atmosphere somewhere it is very corrosive atmosphere. So, in all this I mean you know, features you will find that in all these different applications you will find that you have to use a different type of strain gauges. Then we have armor D which is 70 percent uh, iron, 20 percent chromium, 10 percent aluminum, lambda is same. Platinum tungsten rather I should say it is a very good gauge factor which is 92 percent platinum obviously quite costly, 8 percent tungsten. 
and lambda equal to 4, gauge factor is 4. Because of the gauge is higher, gauge factor is higher, obviously I will get the better and better output. Because as you know that lambda means dr by r by dl by l. So, whenever the lambda is high, so I will get more change of resistance, right. For the same amount of strain, I will get more change of resistance. So, that is very much necessary, okay, to have a simplify our signal conditioning circuit. Then we have a nichrome V 80 percent nickel 20 percent chromium, lambda equal to 2.1, semiconductor strain gauges lambda equal to 130, right. This should be equal, I do not know why it did not come. So, lambda equal to 130, exceptionally high, you see that compared to all this is almost 60 to 70 times more, at least 60 times more, 60 to 60, I mean 5 times more than the conventional wire or please note one thing that whether it is a um, wire type of gauge or a I mean bonded wire gauge or bonded metal foil gauge, the value of lambda does not change. It is a physical property, it depends on the compositions of the materials. People for the over the years they have tested this, you have they have seen they made some funny composition to get the value of lambda higher and higher. So, whether you are using in a bonded uh, metal unbonded gauge, bonded um, gauge or bonded metal foil gauge, it does not matter because ultimately the value of lambda depends on the composition of the material which is used to make the strain gauge. So, bonded metal foil gauge as I told you earlier. Uh, it is the most widely used transducer for stress analysis. It consists of a metallic foil pattern similar to the process used to produce printed circuit board. So, the as you know the printed circuit board because it is printed circuit board what happened that as you know that it is a, a backlight type of materials taken and it is covered with uh, copper. Then a mask is put on this one and and, uh, and it is a, it is a ultraviolet light falls on that. and uh, what whenever the, there is false, whenever it is uh, obstacle, so that portions when you put later on in the liquid, some special liquid you will find that that will go out. The same principle is also used for making the strain gauges. The reason I will tell you after some time. So, photo edge metal foil pattern is installed on a backing material. You see here, it is a typical metal foil gauge, where in the case of wire gauge, these two thickness will be same. Whereas, you see here, all the end resistance are end portions of the strain gauges are made very thick. The reason is, you see when I am subjected to some stress, so I am supposed to that suppose in this case, suppose I am giving it some tension here. So, all this supposed to have a axial tension is not it. Whereas, what will happen you see here on these portions, this will have a transverse, right. But while I am making the calculations, I have not included this part. So, what I have to do? I have to do in such a way, if I make it thick, so the contributions, so the value of R in these portions will be very, very small, is not it, compared to this portion. So, the contribution to the transverse strain or the transverse uh, strain error in this case will be very, very low. That is the reason metal foil gauge purpose, because in the case of wire gauge, I cannot change the dimension of the wire in between, but in the case of metal foil gauge, we can do it, because it is the principles of the uh, principle of the the printed circuit board is utilized to make this type of gauges. So, these end portions are very thick. So, the resistance small, R small, here R small. So, the error, transverse error will be minimum. Transverse strain error will be minimum. You may immediately say, sir, what is the harm if I take a simple stretch of wire like this one? This is not possible. You see that I have to make a sufficient length of the wire, so that the value of R is sufficient. If the R is large, delta R also will be large, please note. So, that will ease our simplified our measurement. If the R is small, R will be small if I take suppose a small length of wire. If I take a full length of wire, this one, so my delta R also will be small. R will be large, delta R also will be large. So, that is, is an all the funny shape, I mean this type of shape you have to make in the case of strain gauges. This is very simplified actually in the find there are uh, various pal it looks like I have several you will find that there are several right means. So, that the value r should be 
that means substantial. So, this value should be very substantial, so that the delta r also will be large, right. So, that is very much necessary. So, this is a bonded metal strain gauge, you see this here, this is a backing materials on which we have put, right. Now, gauge length, the proper uh, choice of the gauge length is important factor for some specific applications strain is to be measured at the location where stress is maximum and the strain gauge averages this measured strain over the gauge length and the measurement can be erroneous due to improper choice of the gauge length, right. So, gauge length is very important. Backing material it electrically isolates the metallic gauge from the test specimen, right, because you see the layer in all the cases you will find strain gauge we will put on a Wheatstone bridge. So, it is electrical circuit. So, if that electrical suppose I am interested to measure the measure the strain or a load on a beam, a steel beam. So, in that type of situation, so it, I cannot connect directly on the steel beam itself. I have to insulate because we are interested only on the strain. We have, I do not want to make electrical connection with the uh, on the steel beam itself, right. So, that is a so it will isolates. First of all, it property is electrical isolates the metallic gauge from the test specimen then it transmits the applied strain to the sensor. It provides the surface that is used for bonding the gauge with the specimen surface where the strain is to be measured. The backing material should have a wide temperature range. Polyamide and the glass reinforced phenolic are two commonly used backing material. These are the most commonly used backing, backing material. You see these are polyamide. So, these are polyamide and glass rain source phenolic and two commonly used backing material. Now, adhesives because you know that uh, this uh, bonded metal gauge I mean wire gauge or foil gauge does not matter it cannot I mean you cannot you have to use some adhesives. So, usually you have to put some adhesives on which and if there is it at least there should be some time of 124 hours you have to keep for the curing or drying up process, right. So, there should be some features as you know in the case that um, while you are installing on a suppose a pipe, okay. Suppose I have a pipe like this one, so I will put on a, a strain gauge over this one. So, I will put a strain gauge, I want to interest it, uh, suppose there is a bending of pipe, how much strain will be developed in that pipe. So, in that case, so I have to put the strain gauge and I have to whatever the uh, strain developed on this pipe, okay, after the one, once it is under tension or compression, same should be transmitted to the gauge itself, right. So, there should be a very strong bonding of the first of all the gauge with the backing material, then backing material with the this test specimen, right. If there is a some gap that means between the test specimens and the and, and the gauge. So, the actual uh, load which is uh, I have given to this um, this pipe or test specimen cannot be will not be fully transmitted to the gauge. So, there will be some error which I do not want, right. So, the bond created by the adhesive serves as a mechanical and thermal coupling of the strain gauges and the test specimen. This is very important because you know the all the strain gauges since it is a resistance it is temperature sensitive. So, I have to make all sorts of temperature compensation and whatever the temperature compensation is there. So, I should have to incorporate that because you see that if the I am not interested uh, resistance change due to the change of temperature. I am interested into the resistance change due to the change of the strain there because if it is there is a resistance change due to the temperature that will be erroneous reading because I am interest I am measuring in the test specimen how much stress is developed, how much load is developed there. So, in that case if there is a some strain developed due to the change of resistance. So, that will give us erroneous reading. Adhesive should be accurately transmit the strain given to the test specimen. It should have a thermal conductions and the expansion characteristics same as the metal itself or test specimen. Thus, adhesive should not shrink or expand during curing process otherwise the pseudo strain will be developed in the gauge. This is also very important because while uh, the curing process means you have to leave for at least 24 day hours. Uh, to dry up or curing process. Once you put the suppose in a 
my pipes I put a strain gauge here. So, I put an adhesive. So, I have to leave it for 24 hours before drying. Now, during drying up, so during drying, during curing process or dry up process, the there should not be any pseudo strain developed. If it is developed, then what will happen? You know that the that resistance strain gauge will be under tension, so it will give you some false reading. Even though you can compensate for that, you can use some other resistance to balance the beads and all those things. But that is not very desirable, right? Now, epoxy uh, and cellulose nitrate cement and ceramic based cements are the some of the adhesives used for making the adhesives. I mean, for adhesives. Now, semiconductor strain gauge is most widely used as I told you because of its high gauge factor. Only problem with the semiconductor strain gauge is that the it is very sensitive to temperature. That means, it is temperature coefficients of is very uh, high. So, that um, uh, immediately it changes the value of this temperature I mean resistance changes as the temperature changes and also the its performance deteriorates in presence of the moisture that is main problem in the case of semiconductor strain gauge. Silicon is the basic material for making the semiconductor strain gauge. Usually silicon is doped with a boron to make p type strain gauge. It will be n type strain gauge if it is a doped with arsenic and the resistance of p type gauges increases with the applied tensile strain and that of the n type gauges decreases. Right? Now, only problem with the strain gauge you see that we will see later on I have to use some dummy gauges for temperature compensation we will see later on this thing. Now, uh, getting two strain gauges, two semiconductor strain gauge of exactly same value of lambda is very difficult because in the, see in the case of I mean metal gauges, the value of the lambda depends on the composition. If the composition is correct, it does not matter whether you make it wire I mean, or metal foil. So, you will get always the same value of lambda. Whereas, in the case of the slight doping changes, in the case of semiconductor strain gauges, its value of lambda changes. Uh, so, the two exactly two gauges having the same value of lambda is very difficult to get. Like beta of a transistor, two beta is always we say that there, there is some, it lies between some value, two values. I cannot have a two transistor exactly same beta. I can measure it and make, make it. Suppose in the complementary symmetry amplifier and push pull amplifier, always we try to make beta of the two transistors same. We pick up and measure if two are equal, we say these are pairs. Now, resistivity of a semiconductor material is given by rho equal to 1 upon q n mu, where I am sorry this will be where. So, this will be where q equal to charge of electrons number of charge carriers that depends on the doping and mu is the mobility of the charge carriers. right? The impurity concentration is typically lies between two values which will come at the end. The resistivity of the p type silicon with the concentration let it comes first then we will You see here the impurity concentration is typically lies between 10 to the power 16 to 10 to the power 20 atoms. The resistivity of the p type silicon with concentration of 10 to the power 20 atoms per centimeter cube is 500 micro mo meter that is much higher than that of the copper. The strain gauge material shows a change. Now, interestingly you will see that if you increase this beyond 10 to the power uh, 20, you would not get any uh, much change of uh, much change of the resistivity in the case of uh, if you apply some strain there. Whereas, if it lies between these two values, you will get sufficient change of resistance in the case of semiconductors that you actually we want. The strain gauge material shows a change in resistivity with strain and this change of resistivity is called the piezo resistive effect and the mobility of the charge carriers changes due to applied strain thus causing the large change in this is the most important. You see in the case of uh, semiconductor strain gauge, this uh, change of resistivity is very high. That is the reason I am getting the 
large value if you remember our main expressions so so it our expression was lambda sorry lambda equal to dr by r <coughs> excuse me dl by l equal to 1 plus 2 nu plus d rho by rho dl by l so this term for the semiconductor strain gauges will vary because of this factor this term is not predominant in the case of uh, metal wire gauges right so that is I am saying the mobility of the charge carriers changes due to the applied strain because the mobility depends on the mobility we have seen right. So the thus causing the large change in resistivity. The advantage you see the high gauge, gauge factor useful for measurement of micro strain very small strain I can measure it is not possible with the case of wire type of gauges whether a foil type or it does not matter foil or wire type in the case of metal gauge it is not possible small gauge length so very small uh, strain gauge sensor we can make so the dimension of the gauge i can make very small as i told you earlier that you see that in the case of pressure sensor we have seen that that small size i can make which is not possible in the case of in, in the case of wet type of gauges now disadvantage is high temperature sensitivity temperature sensitivity we can compensate it is very easy to say that so we can compensate by using the dummy gauges or using four strain gauges but having four semiconductor strain gauge having the exact value of lambda is very difficult nonlinearity so nonlinearity is another factor in this case of semiconductor gauge mounting difficulty is also there because the semiconductor is very i mean if it is diffused that is advantage but if it is not diffused uh, bonded semiconductor strain gauge mounted difficulties will be there and performance deteriorates in the presence of the moisture and instrumentation not necessarily you will measure I mean without moisture I mean sometimes you will have to measure it in some moist where superheated steam is there sometimes you have to use the corrosive liquids sometimes we are having a gas which is very uh, hostile in nature so in that type of situation semiconductor strain gauge is not very suitable. Now see that uh, I will make a, a temperature compensation, strain gauge temperature compensation is there. So it is necessary, I will do the temperature compensation, it looks like this. I have an active gauge, one dummy gauge and fixed resistors. You see here, I have an active gauge. You see that uh, in the case of strain gauge, I can measure with a single strain gauge also. I is, whatever the change of resistance, I will put on a Wheatstone bridge. Uh, suppose there is all the gauges resistance, simple resistance, I put one active gauge. In that situation, there is no problem. I can measure the change of resistance values when it is subjected to strain. But the problem is that you see it will not there, there will not be any temperature compensation. That means due to temperature change, some change of resistance will come. So, my circuit will not take care of that. Whereas, in the case of dummy gauge, dummy gauge the meaning is that this gauge will not subject it to stress or strain. That means, suppose I am interested to measure a, I mean, I mean measure the stress developed on this pipe. So, I will put the actual gauge or active gauge on this one and dummy gauge I will not put over this one. It is also a strain gauge these are not strain gauges to a fixed resistor simple carbon or any other type of resistor but these are basically the strain gauge these two are strain gauge whereas this gauge will be subjected to strain and this will not be i mean this will not be subjected to strain so whereas this is subjected to strain this will not be subjected to strain so what will happen to this this will be very close to the pipe but it is not subjected to any strain so whatever the the reason is why i am saying that this should be very close to the pipe whatever the active gauge have the temperature this dummy gauge should have the same temperature that I want to mean. If I can do that, so there is no problem. So, always we will measure this uh, I mean this change of resistance by Wheatstone bridge. Now, there are two types of uh, measurement one case I will use a uh, balance bridge 
in other case we will use a unbalanced pitch. Now, we will first consider the unbalanced pitch, let us look at. So, in the unbalanced bridge you will find that sorry it is a balanced bridge. So, I have uh, four So, this is my output voltage, this is let us take a Wheatstone bridge. So, otherwise I cannot write, suppose this is I 2, all current different R 2, this is I 4, this is R 4, this is R 3, current is going in this direction I 3 and this is my excitation E x right and I gave some nodal point A B this is A this is A B this is C and this is D. Now, let us let us analyze and let us analyze this circuit ok. For the bridge is to be balanced is to be balanced points B and D must be at the same potential at the same potential. So, I can write I 1 R 1 is not it equal to I 4 R 4 in I 2 R 2 equal to I 3 R 3. So, simply I can divide if I these two equations I will get I 1 by R 1 I 2 by R 2 equal to I 4 by R 4 I 3 into R 3. Now, if there is no current, there is no current in the detector. So, I 1 equal to I 2 and I 3 equal to I 4. So, R 1 by R 2 equal to R 4 by R 3 right. So, right. Now, what will happen? Suppose R 1 is the unknown resistance or our and that means our circuit looks like this if I detour the circuit. So, R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4. So, this is our output voltage. So, suppose now R 1 equal to R x. So, R x unknown volt resistance or strain, strain gauge I can write R 4 by R 3 into R 2, is not it. Now, you see I can use either R 4 or R 2 to make the temperature compensation, is not it. I can choose either of this one because in that case whatever the changes occur in the R x due to the temperature, the same change will occur also in the R 4 and R 2. Then either R 4 can be dummy gauge, this can be dummy gauge or 
R2 can be dummy gauge. Okay. In that case, any of the resistance, if you check R4, suppose for uh, balancing the, I mean for uh, the dummy gauge. So, in that case, R2 can be used to balance the bridge. So, this is the case when there is a no current flowing through the detector. That means, I am assuming in that case, that is, I will vary R2. That means, if I take a new page, that means, So, this is R 1, R 2, R 3, R 4. So, this is our strain gauge suppose and R x. So, as I told you R before R x equal to R 4 by R 3 into R 2. So, this is our active gauge, this is our dummy gauge. Right, that is this is used to for making the temperature compensation. So, ambient temperature compensation because if the ambient temperature changes, my this gauge will take care. So, it sometimes is called ambient temperature compensation also. Ambient temperature compensation and R2 and R3 should be of similar type. So, these are fixed resistors or it can be variable resistors because this variable resistors to balance the bridge because of suppose I have subjective strain again I will make EO equal to 0. So, this R2 can be calibrated in terms of the load right or displacement whatever you like because it can be used for making the displacement sensor also. So, in that case R2 will be calibrated in terms of the displacements or R2 can be calibrated in terms of the uh, in terms of the load also. So, it will be dialed so that it will see look at and then find how much is the load whereas, this will be our make our temperature compensation right. You will find that in latter that we will use 4 gauge simultaneously all are active gauges to increase the value of the uh, value of the I mean unbalanced voltage because I sometimes I need large unbalanced voltage. So, I, I can do it. Now, uh, let us go to the problem, problem 4.1, a steel bar of rectangular cross section 2 centimeter into 1 centimeter subjected to tensile force of 20 kilo Newton, a strain gauge is placed on the steel bar as shown in the following figure. Find the change of resistance of the strain gauge if it has the gauge factor of 2 and the resistance of 120 ohm in absence of the axial load. The Young's modulus of elasticity of the steel is equal to 2 into 10 to the power 8 kilo Newton per meter square. Right? It is no question of bridge or anything simple problem we have given. We have shown this that it is a you see here that the installation it is it is subjected to uh, tensile is not it. So, it is a tensile load here. So, it will be axial. So, there is no question of any transverse. So, there will be axial load and you have to find that the change of resistance in this strain gauge. It is a very simple problem, right. So, no question of bridge or anything we have to with that we will do later on, right. Now, let us uh, solve this problem, ok. Let us take. Uh, I am sorry, I can take this one. Here you see lambda is equal to 2, is not it? And E equal to 2 into 10 to the power 8 kilo Newton per meter square, P equal to 20 kilo Newton and R 
equal to 120 ohm. Area of cross sections we have given A equal to 0 0.0.02 into 10 to the power 0 0.01 meter square. So, stress on the bar bar is sigma A equal to P by A equal to 20 upon 0 0.02 into 0 0.01. So, this will give you 10 to the power 5 kilo Newton per meter square. So, epsilon A or epsilon equal to sigma by E or sigma A by E, E is a Young's modulus 10 to the power 5 by 2 into 10 to the power 8. So, it will be 5 into 10 to the power minus 4. So, d r by r we know by d l by l equal to lambda is not it or I can write d r by r equal to lambda into epsilon a axial. So, delta r or d r will be equal to r epsilon into lambda. So, it is 120 into 5 into 10 to the power minus 4 into um, how it is the resistance 5 10 to the power 4 is the strain multiplied the gauge factor which is advanced probably yes this is advanced strain is obviously 2. So, this will give you change of resistance 0.12 ohm right. So, the answer is 0 0.0.12 ohm. I have solved this problem to know that you see that how small this change of resistance. It is not very easy task to achieve this measure this and as I told you that so just using a, a one simple uh, you can use one resistance that means R2 and calibrate R2 in terms of um, stress or strain is very difficult and as you look at this uh, change of resistance uh, very small. So, mostly we will see that we will use that unbalanced voltage and we will calibrate that unbalanced voltage in terms of displacements or force or pressure or load whatever it and we will use instead of 1 gauge we will use 4 gauge try to gauge 4 gauge. In that case the, there will be more unbalanced voltage ok. Then there we have seen that in the case of in the case of our displacement center 1 gauge will be under compression another gauge will be elongation. I will get the temperature compensation as well as my bridge unbalanced voltage will also be very high. So, that this will help us to make the uh, circuit signal condition circuit simpler because if the small higher the voltage the more and more less will be the error in the measurement also. So, those things is to be to be considered. So, strain gauges we have covered we will see later on in the future uh, lesson that it will be extensively used for the measurement of load right. So, this is the basic sensors which is used but uh, strain gauge alone cannot be used it is by uh, either in the some pressure gauge or some load cell and all those things. And this ends the lesson 4.